Amen. Go to Acts chapter 12. If you're in your notes, if you've got a Bible with you, if you've got Bible as a smartphone app, just go to Acts chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 20. Um, Acts chapter 12, we preached this over a month ago, and in this particular book, or in this particular chapter, I, I should say, a lot of it is about Herod. Um, it is about Herod and the way that he came against God's church. And in the first part of uh, chapter 12, he killed one of the original 12 disciples, James. He martyred him and then he arrested Peter. And if you remember that particular teaching, we looked at how Peter was thrown in jail. Peter was gonna die. And then an angel came and set Peter free out of the prison. And there had been a prayer meeting all night. And we looked at all of that kind of stuff together. At the end of that chapter is this moment with Herod, kind of the end of Herod's story, and we skipped over it for time, but we're going back. Acts chapter 12, verse 20. Now Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they sent a delegation to make peace with Herod because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. When the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes. He sat on his throne. He's in his throne room and he made a speech to them. And here's the reaction. Verse 22, the people gave him a great ovation shouting his voice. It's the voice of a God, not of a man. Now this is important. Now, they're trying to make up with Herod here, these people are, because they need the food that his country provides. So they're sucking up just a little bit, yes? And they say, they kind of overdo it a little bit. After he gets done with his speech, they say, he's not even a man, he's a God. And what you're not gonna see in the passage is him saying, no, don't you dare say that there's only one true God and it's not me. Do you know that this morning there's only one true God and it's not you? It's not you. But he lets the statement stand. He drinks in the praise. Verse 23, instantly an angel of the Lord struck Herod with sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. And so he was consumed with worms and died. That's rough, right? We are not teaching this in kids' Sunday school today, <laughs> just so you know. It's a rough one. Um, Herod meets a sticky end there. Meanwhile, the word of God, verse 24, continued to spread, and there were many new believers. And I just love the way that Dr. Luke, the author of this book, kind of puts that together. Herod just died a gruesome death, but the church of God kept growing. <laughs> like, wow, man. That's a lot, it's a lot to take in. Um, and he dies. Josephus, um, who is a Jewish historian at that time, um, and, and he's part of the royal entourage, Josephus is. He's not a Christian, and he writes history at the same time that these Bible events are taking place. And we have some of Josephus's books. Um, one of them is called Antiquities of the Jews. And in Antiquities of the Jews, he covers many things that are in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, uh, specifically the, the crucifixion of Jesus before Pilate, um, Josephus covers that. And this particular scene with Her Herod, Josephus covers this as well, even with a lot more detail. And Josephus says that he came in adorned in these royal robes that were somehow sequenced and, and they were reflecting the light and it looked like it was kind of like heavenly glory coming off of him. And that's when they all yelled out, he's a God and not a man. And then Josephus says he was struck sick and he went into his tower room for five days and slowly died a painful death. Uh, I, I, I bring up Josephus there just to uh, let you know that one of, the, one of the many ways that we feel more confident about the stability, the veracity, the truth of God's word is because there are other historical sources outside of the biblical record specifically that say the same thing, that were written at the same time, that were written by people who were not Christians and not trying to further necessarily the Christian text, but they affirm it. And that's part of what helps us feel strong about it. So back to the worms for a second. It's a fear, severe reaction from God, yes? It's a big reaction. And, and we see that and, and we're like, why such a big reaction? 
Um, he's, he's walking in pride here and I get it and I get the ego and I, I get that he shouldn't have done it. But the truth is I look around the world today and I see in our political environment and especially in Hollywood, there's a whole lot of people taking praise almost at the level of the divine that they shouldn't be taking. And God's not striking them all dead. So why did he strike this guy dead? I don't know. It is God's sovereign choice. And that's what you see throughout the scripture. Um, There are certain moments when God puts all of the data together, all of the outcomes together and says, I've got to make a point in this moment. Um, And sometimes we don't know all those specifics behind God's wisdom in those decisions that he makes. Um, If you're really curious about this particular topic, why does God sometimes bring this level of a punishment? Go back to Acts part one and look for the week where we did Ananias and Sapphira. We spent the entire week on this particular question and that's my cop out and we're gonna keep moving. We're not going to talk about his death as much. We're going to talk about his pride. Pride is the topic today. Pride, ego, receiving praise that's not meant for you, that you don't deserve, wanting to be top, wanting to be in charge, wanting to be higher than everybody else in the room, pride. How many in this room right now, show a hand, struggle with pride? Okay, I'm preaching this sermon to you. But even more, I'm preaching it to the people who didn't raise their hands, which is the majority of the room. Because pride is sneaky. Pride is the kind of thing in our life, the kind of sin in our life, the kind of dysfunction in our life that we don't realize is there. Because a lot of the other sins, they're much more obvious to us, right? But pride is, is one of those things that's really difficult to discern in our own life. It's a sneaky sin. So today is a Bible study on pride. We're going to start in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. And this is a particular passage. It's a prophecy in the book of Isaiah about what's called the the king of Babylon. And when it's describing the king of Babylon, it talks about his demise Um, He begins to use language that scholars believe. He's not just talking about the physical king of Babylon that existed at the day and age of that prophet, but that the prophet through the Holy Spirit of God is also at the same time speaking about Satan himself. The same thing happens in the book of Ezekiel. The same thing happens in the book of Revelation. This particular scene is described. So in verse 12, he says, how you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning, which means Lucifer. You've heard that name before. We don't know if that's a title or if that's a name of Satan. You've been thrown down to earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, look what he said. I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. Stars, there are angels. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and I will be like the most high. Lucifer's chief sin, his first sin was his pride. Was the impulse inside of him that says, I will not be second place. I will not let someone else sit on the throne. I will not be less in glory and power and holiness than the one true God. I will be like the most high. That longing, he brings it to the first man and the first woman. So go to Genesis three, verse four. And this is a familiar scene. This is in the garden of Eden and the woman and the serpent are, are next to the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they've been told not to eat. And the serpent says in verse four, you won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God. Do you see it? Knowing both good and evil. He entices her with the same lie and the same sin that he had fallen for. Of course, he assumes 
that that's the thing that I wanted more than anything else was to be above God, to be like God. She must want the same thing. And he entices her with his own pride. Verse six, the woman was convinced and she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took the fruit and ate it and then gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. I want to be as wise as God. I want to be as holy as God. I want to be on the throne of my own life. I want to be captain of my own ship. I don't want to obey anybody else. I don't want to submit to anybody else's plans for me. I want to make my own plans and follow my own plans and gain my own glory that I earned myself. Even Moses, you keep going through the scripture and you start to see how this disease of pride had gone through all the different characters of scripture. Even Moses shows up with it. There's a moment where God tells Moses to speak to the rock. And when, the, the, when he spoke to the rock, the rock would start to pour out water so that the people could drink because they're in the middle of the desert. And Moses comes up to it and he strikes the rock. And when he strikes it, he says, must I bring this water from the rock for you? How dare you, Moses? The supernatural miracle was done by God himself. You were merely his instrument. And he says, shall I bring the water from the rock for you? He was taking credit for what was not his own. And Moses was dealt with by God. Even David later on, he's king of Israel and at some point, I don't know if he got bored or what it was, but he decides one day that he wants everybody in Israel to be counted. He wants a census to be taken. Maybe so he can get to the end of it and he can brag about how many people we've got here. But he goes and he takes that census and God sees through to his heart and he sees the pride that's in David and he judges David as a result. You get to the time of Jesus and in the gospels and you see it with James and John because they're always fighting amongst the disciples for who is the greatest amongst us 12. They always want to be the top and Jesus is always discouraged by that fight and that argument that's always go, going on. James and John even come to Jesus at one point and they say, when you come into your kingdom, we would like the, the, to sit on your right and on your left, which were the top two places in a throne room. And Jesus said, no, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve Amen. and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus would eventually go and wash the disciples' feet and say, I've served you in the most humble way. Now you go and do likewise. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you'll be the servant of all. See, Jesus came to bring an upside down kingdom to us. We're going to talk about Jesus more in just a few minutes, but we're not done diagnosing ourselves yet. Pride is our greatest enemy. Thomas Aquinas said, pride is is the mother of all sin. Early church father, Jonathan Edwards in the 1700s, there was a revival in Massachusetts. And as he was seeing all these people come to God, this is one of his diagnoses. He wrote, the first and worst cause of errors that abound in our day and age is spiritual pride. This is the main door by which the devil comes into the hearts of those who are zealous for the advancement of Christ. Who's zealous for the advancement of Christ? He's talking about Christians. He's saying the chief problem amongst Christians is spiritual pride. It's sneaky. John Stott said, pride is your greatest enemy. Humility is your greatest friend. And then Tim Keller put it like this. He said, pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. It silently and slowly kills you without even knowing. And of course, I got to quote C.S. Lewis. He's the one who wrote uh, Chronicles of Narnia that Tanner was talking about earlier. Um, pride is behind all the sins, Lewis says. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Man, that's a big statement, Lewis. It's the one thing that's been behind all the darkness in every family and every nation since the world began. What about atheism? What about war? What about disease? No, it's been pride. Pride is the thing underneath all the other things. 
lurking behind all the pain. More scripture for you out of Proverbs. God opposes the proud. Proverbs 11, 2, pride leads to disgrace. Proverbs 16, 18, it's pride that goes before destruction and a prideful spirit before a fall. Some of you grew up hearing this statement, pride goes before a fall, that right as soon as your ego really starts to take command, as soon as you really think you got a handle on life, then you fall. Pride. Proverbs 6, 16, there are seven things that God hates. Those are seven abominations. That's the Hebrew word there. There are seven abominations of God. The first one in the list is eyes of pride. Some of your uh, translations would say haughty eyes. It's the same thing. What are eyes of pride? Eyes of pride are like the way I see the whole world. I see it through the lens of, I have to be number one. I have to be in charge. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Even, even, even more so, we definitely see it with Herod there, but God opposes any proud person and he opposes the pride that's in your own heart. There are some things that maybe you could even look back on in your own past and you can see where God himself was coming against you. Maybe some things in your life right now that are being driven by pride and God stands in opposition against you when you're full of pride. Well, why in the world would he do that? Here's why. Because if pride is the thing that is leading your soul off a cliff of destruction, guess where a loving God is gonna put himself? He's gonna stand between you and the cliff and he'll oppose you because he loves you. Amen. That's our God. Okay, so you're hearing this and you're like, come on, this is some kind of crazy Christian thing. Surely pride isn't this big of a deal. So let's look at it just a little bit closer. Pride shows up as a self-reliance. I can be holy and I can be happy on my own and I can succeed in this life in my own strength. I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps and then I will get the credit at the end. Self-reliance, sound familiar? What self-reliance is, is the surface sin. It's pride that's underneath it. Let's look at entitlement. I've worked so hard, that's why I deserve this drink. I've worked so hard, that's why I deserve this vacation. And if someone would wanna stop me, I'm gonna get angry with them because I deserve this vacation. I'm not just getting a vacation, I deserve a vacation because I've worked so hard. Do you hear the entitlement? And I deserve this fancy car. And I deserve these clothes, right? I deserve a break today, McDonald's. See, I mean, come on. Like I deserve, I deserve. I deserve to let my anger out toward the people in front of me because they just don't realize what a difficult day I've had and how hard I work and the way that we explain our actions away in entitlement and pride. How about greed? Even though the house that I have and the money that I make is vastly more than my parents and my grandparents ever had. I still have looked down the street and noticed that my neighbors have more than I do. And so I need a better house and my kids need better clothes and we need to go better schools and, and we need better, you know, sports coaches for my kids because they're definitely going to the NFL and <laughs> like I need all of that and, and I've got it coming to me. That's, that's pride, that's greed. Amen. What about unforgiveness when I, when I'm betrayed or I'm hurt by somebody, especially somebody that I care about, I have a right to balance the scales again. And I'm gonna balance the scales again of justice by getting revenge on them through things like silent treatment or things like cruelty. And, and maybe it won't be physical, but it's gonna be verbal. And, and maybe it's gonna be emotional and maybe it's gonna be subtle and maybe it's gonna be gossip, but I'll get my revenge because, why? Because vengeance will make me happier. And it will give me this polluted sense of worldly peace that I long for. Pride blinds us to the gospel itself. Amen. Why? Because the gospel is what comes along and says, no, man, you were full of sin and the wages of sin is, is, is death. And the only way that you got saved is that a loving savior came and he paid for your sins on a cross. And as soon as he paid for your sins on a cross and he died for you and he forgave you, God himself forgave you. 
You no longer have any right to be unforgiving toward another human soul. You lost the right back here. And that's the, that's the gospel itself. So how in the world could we as Christians ever hold on to say, and I'm talking to myself here. My goodness. Unforgiveness is a regular part of our life, isn't it? We have a hard time letting go of grudges. We have a hard time, especially in our marriages, letting go of stuff. And it makes no logical sense. What it is, is it's pride inside of us. I'm sometimes cruel to others because they annoy me. And my annoyance is more important than their well-being. That's pride. How about my vanity? I am beautiful and I am fit and I am strong and I should be admired for that. I manage my image in person and online. It's a core need that I manage my personal image because they need to follow me and they need to like me and they need to admire me and they, they need to be thinking about me all the time. And when they're not thinking about me all the time, I feel a certain kind of emptiness inside. Self-obsession, vanity, when others don't pay attention to me. And, and, and this one gets a little weird because it's, it's kind of a low self-esteem version. We don't associate pride with that. But pride can just be a self-obsession. And it can be a low self-esteem and it kind of fools us in that way. But when other people are going out and, and they're forming friendships and there's a little group that we're not a part of and, and you see evidence of their having dinner together and I wasn't invited and, and, and it's just, it's the way human beings are, but I take it personally. And they should know about my low self-esteem and they should have been more sensitive to me. Darn it, that's a click and how dare they? And, and now all of a sudden I'm offended because they didn't stroke my ego. See, low self-esteem is a brokenness as well and it can lead us to all kinds of bitterness and cruelty toward other people because they weren't sensitive enough to us. See, it's pride. Do you see how pride is underneath so many different things? It's the mother of all sin or I trust my own wisdom, so I'll do life my way. Elitism, I'm right about my politics and everybody else is wrong. And the reason that I'm right about my politics is because I'm smarter than you are. And I've read more stuff and I've read better stuff than you've read. And I've been more thoughtful about it. And I've put it together with history and just the way that I put it together in my mind. I'm right and I'm going to vote right. And you're wrong and you're going to vote wrong. Oh, you're getting quiet now. My inner voice is right and my inner voice can be trusted even within my own family, even at work. So if anybody would come along and criticize me ever... When they come along and criticize me, I get to disagree with them and I get to ignore their criticism or even their counsel and their discernment in my life. And the reason I get to ignore it is because I'm right and they're wrong. I trust me. There are things in the Bible that I disagree with, verses in the Bible that I disagree with. God was, I don't know that God was wrong necessarily, but he's certainly outdated. And even if he's outdated, he certainly didn't meet, see me coming. He didn't understand my situation. I'm special. And there's probably like an expiration date on a lot of these verses, really. And so I get a look at the Bible and say, no, that doesn't apply to me because you know how the thoughts go. That's pride. Do you see myself? Do you see me sitting myself above God himself? I will be like the most high. I know better. I don't need to hear this pride challenge at church today, but I can think of others that really need this. <laughs> and I'm going to go right home and send them the link to the message because I, I could see their faces in my mind right now. They really need it. Not me. They, need, they really need it. <sighs> and there's a possessiveness, right? And this is, this is a really big deal. This stops us from all kinds of things that God wants us to do. But my life is my own. My time is my own. My plans are my own. My retirement is my own. My money is my own. My kids are my own. It's all my own. And I own it. it, it no one else has a right to it. Not even God has a right to it. 
And so if God would ever come in and ask me to sacrifice anything out of my life, the answer is going to be no. And it's not greed, folks, it's pride. Because I believe that it's mine. Um, Myself, personally, when I first got saved, um, I didn't know I had pride. Um, We talked about this at Growth Track class this last uh, Sunday night. Um, I grew up in the church. I was raised in the church. I knew a lot about the Bible, but the, the change had never really happened inside of my soul. And so I could say all the right things to you. I could fool you really, really well that I was a Christian. But the thing was, whenever in the privacy of my own life, I was doing my own thing and doing things that I knew that God did not approve of, it didn't matter to me. It didn't matter to me that I was violating the will of God because I didn't care about God. And I would have never told you that. I would have told you I love Jesus, but I didn't show it in my actions. See, when you love Jesus, you start to care about what Jesus has said to you about your life. It's inescapable. And so as soon as I got saved for real, the Holy Spirit came into my soul The scripture says the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When that Holy Spirit came into my soul and began to convict me, I was floored at the pride I was seeing in my life every single day. Oh God, my ego is out of control. Oh God, every single thing that I do is driven by me trying to shape people's image of me all the time. Even in religious context, when people are praying, when I start to pray, the whole time I'm praying, I'm like, I better put together the perfect prayer so they're really impressed by me. Every time I meet a new Christian, I'm trying to to get my spiritual resume out there in front of them so that they're really impressed and they realize that I'm here and they're really down here. Because this is what we do. And I, I was seeing it every day and I was under such conviction, it just broke my heart. And I started praying to God every day, God, like you gotta remove pride from me. This is crazy. And I prayed that every single day for a year. God, remove pride, remove pride, remove pride. And God came to me at the end of that year and just led me, spoke to me, I don't know what, and said, the pride in you will be the last of your sins to fall. But I'll work on you. And God has worked on me. And I praise him for that. But guys, this is, this is the mother of all sins. And it's in us and it's deep. And it was right there at the beginning with Adam and Eve and with all of their children ever since. I was talking recently with a mentor. If, if I haven't made you uncomfortable yet, it's about to get worse. <laughs> I was talking recently with a mentor and I was talking about just s- preaching sermons and talking about the fact that um, preaching sermons is a, is a risky business for a pastor and you kind of stick your guts out there and um, you kind of want people to come to you afterward and say, you know what, that was the best sermon we've ever heard in our life. And you get kind of mopey when people don't. And you wait around Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, And as soon as someone comes and and they give you just the tiniest morsel of encouragement, pride takes over inside of me. Um, Yeah, I'm pretty good. You're right. It was awesome. Um, You're right. Um, I don't need anybody. I've got this. That confidence kind of comes in. I've got this. Maybe don't even need God. I'm not going to say that out loud. I am a pastor for heaven's sake, but I feel it. Look how capable I am. I should write a book. I should, I should be admired. I should be respected by many more people that already ex- respect and admire me because pride is never satisfied. It's always hungry for more, Amen. more, more, more. Um, if only more people knew about me. Are you creeped out yet? <laughs> you should be. If you didn't know that your pastor has a sin problem, Congratulations. I do. Uh, I'm broken and in need of a savior, just like you are. And this sin of pride is something that we all wrestle with. Um, There's an old hymn called Come Now Fount of Every Blessing. This is one that I sing. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. 
Here's my heart, Lord. Oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. We're actually going to sing that later. Powerful, powerful hymn. Okay, so how do we get free of pride? So if the diagnosis has left you in a spot today where you're like, okay, I'm in agreement. I see it in my life sometimes or in some places. How do we get free of it? And, and I, I would just say to you, this next section where we're gonna talk about humility, it's only gonna make sense if you're really hungry for it. Otherwise, it won't. And this section on humility, it's gonna start with Jesus, which is, of course, where it should start. But if I could summarize the whole thing, this is what I would say. You don't actually get rid of pride. What happens is that humility comes in almost like a foreign presence and it begins to build itself. The spirit of Christ begins to build itself as a spirit of humility in your soul, in your life, in your actions. And like a light, it drives out the dark. That's really how this works. You're never gonna sit down with pride and wrestle it and win. You're gonna pray that God would bless you with his Holy Spirit filled with humility, and that will drive it out. Philippians 2 verse 3, humility is glad to be lower and to give its life away. This is the way that humility works. If humility comes into you, this is the way humility will be. Verse 3, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Now I'm going to pause that really quick. This is a massive verse. Notice he says, think of others as better than yourselves. Now in my experience, I really don't think that passage is trying to say from a self-respect, self-concept perspective, you're supposed to see yourself as low and, as them, and them as high, or you're ugly and they're pretty, you're, you're, you're dumb and they're smart. I, I don't think that's what the verse is talking about. I think what the verse is saying is that when I come into a room with some other people, I see them as more important than me, Amen. more significant than me. Because if I can start to lean into that, that God wants these people served, I stop worrying about whether or not I get served. Okay? Like if, if I start to position the priorities in my own heart, I might just be open to the idea that I should serve them. I need to love them. I need to sacrifice for them. I need to not worry about my own needs for just a heartbeat. And that's what he's talking about. And then look at verse six. Though he was God, though Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, Jesus gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Wow. So this is Jesus, right? Like you got to hold that picture up against what we saw with Satan and Adam and Eve. They were all about, I'm not like the most high. I will be like the most high. So hear the ambition. I will be number one. I will be like God. I will be top. I'm not gonna obey anybody. I'm not gonna sacrifice for anybody. That's what's in us. And so Jesus comes and he says, I'm already God, but I'm not gonna cling to it. I'm gonna reduce myself and I'm gonna empty myself, and I'm gonna become a servant. Did you know Jesus was born into poverty? Did you know he came to a stable Christmas? Do you know none of that was an accident? Like, he came to show us what humility was. And at one point he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. And that's the way Jesus was all about. And not only did he serve everybody that he was in front of, but then he said, even the things that I say that you all think are so brilliant, we've been talking about for 2000 years. He said, I didn't come up with any of the words. God, the father came up with the words. I only speak the words the father gives me to speak. Hear the humility? You're like, my goodness. And he's like, and I don't even do anything on my own. I only do the things and think about miracles and, 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 and parables and, and, and all his self-sacrifice. He says, I only do the things that the father tells me to do. So he lived his entire life listening to God the father and doing what God the father told him. 
total submission, total yielding of everything, and then giving glory and credit to God the Father. He came to a people that are completely poisoned by pride, and he showed us the way of humility through his actions, all the way to a cross. Consider other people more important than you. Humility is glad to give itself away. It's glad to sacrifice itself. It's glad to obey, not its own agenda, but, but God's agenda instead. He is the opposite. Um, there's a book that my wife read. It's called The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. And she, she read this book um, and it just kind of blew her mind. And she's like, Josh, you got to read this book. And it's called The Hiding Place. And, and so right before we went on vacation just recently, um, I took the book and read it. And I would say it is in the top five of, of books I've read in my entire life. Blew me away. So good. The story is of a, a little family of five, might be six, and they're watchmakers. They're watch repair people in uh, Holland during World War II. And the Nazis begin to rise to power and they're Christians and they love God, super deep family. And, and the Nazis rise to power. They invade Holland. And as they do, Jews start getting carted off not only labeled with those Star of Davids that they had to wear, but they start getting sent off to prison and then eventually to camps. And so this family, the Ten Bone family, they just start doing what God calls them to do. And, and as people are looking for a place to hide, as people are looking for a place to live where they won't get arrested, they start to hide different ones. And you've read stories like this and seen accounts like this. And they had this hidden room upstairs in Corey's room behind a brick wall that they hid, I think, seven Jews behind. And this was just their life. And and then it grew. And they never set out to be part of any kind of underground resistance, by the way. They just kept responding to people who were in need. And the question that kept coming up over and over again was, wait a second, if I help them, I'm coming against the Nazis and I might get sent off to a concentration camp too. Yes. Yes, you are risking that. So there's a moment where they had filled up their secret room and they were becoming part, more and more part of this underground and a mother and her infant had come to their back door looking for a place and they had no room for her. And so Corey starts reaching out to different people who might have space. And she finds out about this pastor, this clergyman who's got a house out in the country and, and, and she calls him in and, and, and she even tries to manipulate him a little bit. She takes the, the, the little Jewish baby and puts it in his hands, makes him hold it. And she's like, will you go and hide this family and he looks down at the baby and he says, I cannot risk our lives for a Jewish child. And in that moment, Corey's father, Casper, the old man, comes and takes the baby, holds it up to his, his face, up to his white beard. And at last he looks at the pastor and he says, you say we could lose our lives for this child. I would consider that the greatest honor that could come to my family. And by the end of the war, they had saved over 800 people, just their little family in their little watch shop. But they were all hauled off to prison camps as a result. It is not an easy story. They did not escape danger. Several of them lost their lives in those uh, labor camps and those prisons as a result of what they had done. I think we have been drinking the Kool-Aid of the American dream for far too long. And let me qualify that. I love democracy. I, I believe in capitalism. I love America. I'm thankful to live in this country. You soldiers in the room, what you do for us, I can't be thankful enough for what you do for us. Praise God, we have what we have. But there is this subtle thing of go and get for yourself. And this go and get for yourself mentality and go and build your house with the white picket fence and have the dog and have the two cars and have all the college paid for and do all of the things that you want to do. It's all about you. And we bought into that. That's not Christianity. No. If God gives us that, praise God. 
If we receive that, praise God. They received a house, but then they gave it away. Because if you think it's all about you and you've drunk in the, the lie part of that, you won't sacrifice when the time comes. You doing okay? Philippians 2, humility is glad to get no credit for salvation. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you are wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God calls you. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. I gotta hit pause there real quick. He just said, none of you were pretty before Jesus. None of you were powerful. None of you were wise. None of you had enough money. And he just kind of lays it out. The apostle Paul does. He's like, listen, most of us that were called to Jesus, we were in a place of needing Jesus. So we were not the cream of the crop. Like Jesus didn't throw a party in heaven because, oh, look at them. They joined the Jesus team. We're so glad. It's not like that. He loved you as an individual. It's not that you brought something to the equation to add to his team. Does that make sense? Paul's like, remember who you were. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. God made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as scripture says, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Because everything else in your life was given to you. And I don't have time to explain that anymore, but God shows you, God woke you from the dead. God saved you. Stop trying to be pretty and powerful and worrying about your likes and your influence. Let it all go. That's the little stuff. First Corinthians four, humility is glad that all I have is a gift for what gives you the right to make such a judgment. What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if God gave you, if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? So whatever talents, whatever intelligence, whatever skills, whatever gifts, whatever money, whatever looks, whatever pedigree, whatever family, whatever um, college degrees you've got, whatever you've got is all a gift from God. And because of that, there's no right to have any pride in it at all. Luke 18, humility is glad to need the rescue of Jesus even today. Verse nine, some of you guys are gonna recognize this. It says, to some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. I gotta stop right there. He's talking to religious people. Religious people who are so confident that they're good with God and that they've done all that they need to do and that they're pretty holy people. Jesus tells this parable to them. The point is we still need Jesus today. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. And some of you guys know the end of the story. And then another man goes and stands on a different street corner and he's the tax collector. He's the sinner. He's the one that we don't like. And he beats his chest and he says, have mercy on me, God, a sinner. And Jesus says, this is the man who went home justified before God that day. Not this guy bragging about his accomplishments. We need Jesus with our pride today. Next, humility is glad that serving is true greatness. Mark 10. So Jesus called the disciples together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. So Jesus holds up a new ethic for the kingdom of God, this upside down kingdom And he says, service is the way to greatness because service is the way out of pride. To serve other people and to give yourself away like the 10 bones did, that's the way that you start to put to death the demands of your own heart. It's in the action of giving away the way that Jesus did. I give away everything. I give away my time. I give away my money. I give away my agenda. 
And it's little bits at a time, right? Because God is kind and he's patient, but he'll, he'll start to ask you to serve in all of these ways. And what's happening is you're starting to loosen your grip on yourself and on what you want and need and demand. Some of us are like, if the day ever comes and I got to risk my life for somebody else, I'll do it. And here's the thing. If you're not doing it in small ways today, you won't then. Serving is the way out of pride. Yes. Another story about the sisters. You can tell I'm fired up about this book. For the next six months, I'm just going to preach out of this hiding place book. Just joking. But that's Corey and that's Betsy and that's uh, Nala uh, Tenboom. And the first two sisters, um, they're thrown into a train and they're hauled off to a concentration camp together. And for the remainder of the war, they don't even know what happens to Nala. And I don't want to run the ending for you because you should read it. But I'll run this part. They, they get to the concentration camp. And somehow God works miraculously because they're like, if only we could have a Bible, a Bible in the concentration camp, that would help us get through. And God gives them a Bible. One of the nurses provides it for them and she's able to hide it on her person. And they're literally strip searching them as they go into the camp. But somehow God gives them blindness and they search the woman before and they search the woman after and they don't search Corey. And so she gets through with a Bible. They have church services every night in the middle of the concentration camp, reading God's word, worshiping him. They walked in and there was, there was um, uh, uh, fleas everywhere. And at first they're like, this is terrible. And then they started to realize that because of the fleas, the guards, the male guards won't come into the room because they don't want to get the fleas, which means they're not abusing the women in there. And means that they don't bother their church service that they're trying to have in there. And people are coming to Jesus Christ in the middle of a concentration camp. And there's this one moment where they bring the ladies out and they're looking for disease and different things like that. And they do make them all stripped down to nothing. And they're marching these women around. If you've seen like Schindler's List, you've seen uh, pictures like that. And, um, and they're making them completely naked march around in front of these soldiers. And these ladies are like 50 years old, okay? But she's seen these male soldiers and they've got kind of this sexual glee in their eyes while they're walking around. And Corey's just disgusted by it, ashamed. And she's just struggling within herself. And she's the author of this book. So she's writing about all of it, and just everything that she's wrestling with. And all of a sudden her sister, Betsy, says, oh, Corey... She says, Jesus was stripped naked on the cross and I never thanked him. So Betsy's in the middle of the same disgust that she is. And she's like, it just occurred to me that Jesus was stripped naked too and shamed. And he did that for me. And I never once thanked him for it. And now here I am exp experiencing it. And I've got a new way of gratitude with my savior. Now, I just lost like 80% of the room because you're like, that's nuts. It is nuts. It is nuts because all of us would be about our own survival. All of us would be about the injustice of it all. All of us would be filled with thoughts of rage and anger and revenge. Or God, just get me through. She was in a different place. She's thinking about the cross, thinking about her savior. Think about being, being more thankful than she's ever been before. Guys, that's a different level. But you're talking about these ladies that have been denying themselves and risking their lives for probably four years of occupation up to that point. Do you see what Jesus built in them? If you're like me, you feel the heat off of their faith and it feels otherworldly and you want it. I want it. I'm done with pride. I'm sick of pride. I want it gone from my life. It's the thing that keeps bringing destruction. I want to be free of it. I want to be set free of it. Oh God, bring humility into my life. If that's your prayer today, 
It's only a miracle ever. So here's the practical how-to, and this is what we're gonna pray here in just a second. We've done a lot of diagnosing today. As you're going through your life and having interactions and you see pride start to creep up, don't deny it. Take it to God. Pray a prayer, whisper it in a moment. God, would you bring humility into my heart? Because I don't have it right now. Don't be shocked, don't be surprised, don't be condemned. But God, I need you to build humility in my heart. It's a supernatural thing. It's a foreign spirit. It is not part of my human brokenness from Adam and Eve. They didn't give it to me. Only Jesus can give it to me. Pray for that. Why don't you guys stand? Jesus, we worship you. And I mean that. Lord, our minds are filled with not just what you did on the cross for us, Lord, but the way you lived your life, even the way that you came to us in poverty, Lord, the way that you came to serve, Lord, every day of your life, risking your life, giving yourself away to others. God, we want to be that way. So God, I I pray for a miracle all across this room, Lord, that you would begin to change us, Lord. And I know it happens moment by moment and day by day, but Lord, would you come in, Lord, and would you start to give birth to this spirit inside of us? Be the light, God, that drives out the dark of our lives. We love you, Jesus, in Christ's name, amen.